Hi, my name is Farzad, and today we're going to talk about actor model, a new mental model to thinking about complicated React applications. Uh, before we jump into the talk, I wanted to quickly just uh, thank the organizers of React Finland for giving me this opportunity again to stand on the stage of this conference and present my ideas. The purpose of this talk would not be to get a hardcore, um, practical, hands-on uh, you know, um, demonstration of the implementations of actor model, but rather I tried my best to focus on the uh, abstract concepts and try to get the foundational plus right. Because I believe if you get the foundations right, then it wouldn't really matter uh, what the implementation of actor model is and which one we're using. Hopefully, this talk will reach out to uh, the audience that are uh, interested in learning more about actor model, and hopefully the resources that I'm going to be sharing at the end of this slide deck will also help you get on running with the actor model more, even more. As I mentioned, my name is Farzad. I'm a senior front-end engineer working at a company named Epic Games. It's a web uh, gaming. It's a gaming company, but I'm a web developer. I'm not a game developer myself. I'm really passionate about the state machines, the state chart, and specifically talking the XS State Library and the state, stately AI team. You can reach out to me on GitHub under github.com slash farskate or Twitter slash uh, farzad underscore yz. If you're also keen to check my website, you can go to farzadyz.com. Let's uh, cut to the chase and dive right into the actor model. What's the definition of actor model? Actor model is an architecture that's as old as 40 years old. Um, it's an architecture that proposes a really simple yet elegant a way of uh, orchestrating logic in your application. In actor model, everything is an actor. An actor is an entity that has a private state, can send messages to the outside world, meaning to the other actors, and can also receive messages from those actors. If it receives a message, it has a chance to process that message and possibly change its internal state. And then if other actors need to be aware of uh, the change in that state, or at least part of that, then this actor can also send a message to those actors saying that here's the change and here's the new value of the state. In actor model, nothing happens magically. If there is a change, it means there has been a message asking for that. And that means everything is quite clear and the entire integration layer of your application has been brought to the surface. So it means the integration problems can be caught before they catch you as box. When you use actor model uh, in the context of React front end development applications, uh, it means when we move from uh, imperative uh, DOM operations to thinking about declarative and composable components, we are dealing with a tree of components that build upon each other and make our entire application. Similarly, we can think of the application using actor model as a tree of uh, as a tree of stateful bits called actors that are interacting with each other, and uh, there is a root guardian actor on top that's probably spawned at the beginning of your application, and that can dynamically spawn any ad hoc actor to continue with the rest of the behavior of the application. But these two trees don't necessarily map to each other. Not all the comp components need to know about all the actors and don't even need that. There is a many-to-many -many relation between components and actors. And this gives your UI a chance to only get notified about the things that it cares about, not the entire uh, store that we see in Redux. And saying that, it means if um, it means that if you're coming from um, the world of Redux to actor model, in Redux, the UI subscribes to an entire giant brain store called the, the Redux store. And Redux then uh, gets the messages and passes that through a synchronous chain of reducers. Each reducer has a change, has a chance to change the state and react upon that. And at the end, the uh, new value of the state is going to be notified to the to, is going to be sent to the UI again. But in actor model, it feels like we got those reducers, taken them out from the chain of uh, store. Now each of them are one little store. They can interact with each other. They can send messages to each other. They have their internal state. And your entire UI, your entire React component tree is just yet another actor in the entire system. Uh, one thing that I wanted to focus here at the beginning of the talk is that with actor model, we learned that uh, integrations are brought to the surface. And integrations matter. Why? Because when the applications grow, when we're dealing with the largest scale applications, not necessarily the number of units, which are the actors and the components in the application grow, but rather the amount of communication between these units grow. 
with using component libraries such as Chakra or Material UI, you probably don't build your features by adding new components, but rather building your features upon those primitive reusable components from those component libraries. You can do the same with actors. You can create so many primitive uh, reusable actors and then build your, your features upon those instead of having to create and more adding more logic by feature to your application. Guillermo Rush once tweeted something very famous saying that you have to write tests for your application, but you don't have to necessarily write too many tests. You can just mostly focus on writing integration tests. And this is very important because now with actor model, integrations are brought to the surface, they're exposed, they're now very predictable, they can be traced and you can have a time travel through that. And you can even see the sequence diagram or the user flow that the users have taken into your application. Imagine that when the users are dealing with a bug and they're feeling a crash reporting, or you have a crash reporting service that's automatically you know, issuing these uh, problems in your crash reporting service, you only have to record the messages that have been passed as a sequence diagram in your application and then automatically run some integration then against them to find the problem in a chain. Meaning that if there is a problem in one of the uni units, since units are really isolated and narrowed down, it's usually very quick to find those problems. But if an integration fails, it means you have to uh, prepare an entire environment, put uh, find the uh, relevant actors, put them in the right order, step into that, go one by one, and find the outlier uh, behavior right there. So integration problems are much harder to diagnose and debug than unit problems. And hopefully with the use of actor model, you can bring that to the surface and make it more predictable. Step one to using actor model for modeling the application is to being able to identify different concerns in your application and assigning an actor to those concerns. Let's take a very simple React application for an example here. Let's say that we have a markdown render application. There is a markdown editor on the right side, and there is a preview of the compiled markdown to HTML on the left side. There's also uh, a login, uh, a signing and sign out system. If the user has an active session, we retrieve the user info, show it on the top right sidebar of the application. And the users can retrieve these uh, already saved uh, sources in the database by appending a, an ID in the query parameter in the URL. If there is an ID, then your application need to pick it up, uh, talk to the database, fetch the uh, content, prefill the editor with that. If the user presses the compile button, that means the editor content, assuming that it's a valid markdown, needs to be compiled to uh, HTML, and then the preview section needs to pick it up and show it as HTML to the end user. And if the user presses the save button, the current value of the markdown editor should be saved uh, into the same database that we read the sources from in the beginning. Now, the user stories that we just thought about in this simple example, uh, they can be reduced to um, a set of concerns, and each of those concerns can be categorized under a responsibility of one actor. Previ uh, well, starting from retrieving, reading the source ID from the query parameters and talking to the database, attempting to get the source of markdown for that particular ID, and then if that's successful, uh, getting the source, notifying the editor that here is the editor content, that can be uh, one concern, a similar concern is when the user presses the save button, then you're going to have to get the current editor value and talk to the same DB and save it there. So these two are very similar. They can be categorized under the same concern. We can assign a source actor to that. Similarly, previewing the parse markdown can go under a preview actor, parsing the markdown source and prefilling the editor with the retrieve source can also go under the editor actor showing the toast messages can, have, can uh, have its own notification actor. Signing in a sign out can obviously be categorized under an authentication actor. But how would these actors play out in the field to make up the entire application logic? Here's where the sequence diagrams or the user flows or the scenarios coming. And uh, an analogy that I'm in favor of for applications is that applications are like movies that um, have scenarios. Uh, in this case, applications can, are movies that have multiple scenarios. And the user of your application, based on some criteria, can take one of those scenarios and your, use your application uh, using that scenario. So it's like your application is a living movie that has different scenarios and can, users can do that. And with the actor model, getting these uh, sequence diagrams or user flows out and learning them is going to be very predictable and easy. For example, in this sample application, you can see that reading the ID 
um, and, and retrieving the source from the database can have this sequence diagram. As you can see, there are like uh, the, the identified actors are on the top of this sequence diagram. And the only actors that are playing their role in this scenario, the scenario of reading the ID, talking to the database, and getting the source are the source actor, notification actor, and editor actor. Assuming that there is an ID in the query parameters, source will read that from the URL, send a message to itself saying, I found an ID. Then it reads the, uh, reads, uh, try to send the ID to the database, sending another message to itself that, hey, you have to read it from the database. Then if the content from the database has been retrieved successfully, it sends a message to the editor saying, hey, I uh, received the, this content. You now have to pre-fill it in your value. But if something goes wrong while retrieving the source content, it sends a message to the notification actor saying that, I, was, I wasn't able to retrieve the content that the user was asking for. So the notification actor can act on upon that and show a fancy toast message for that. Similarly, for the scenario of saving source, we can also have another sequence diagram. With saving, if the user presses the save button, it means the UI now needs to send a message to the source actor saying that the user has pressed the save button. In response to that, source will tell the editor that, hey, I want to get your content. An editor will also send a message to back to source saying that, hey, here's my latest content. Source will also uh, get that content, send a message to itself back saying that I want to save the content in the DB. And now the entire side effect of uh, sending the post request to the database is going to be uh, performed here. If that fails, source needs to notify the notification actor with the error message. So that will be shown. If it's successful, source will send a message to itself saying that the yeah, ID was successful. So it's your chance to save the ID or any other metadata you want from the updated source in your internal uh, private state. It will also uh, send a message to the uh, notification system saying that, hey, I was able to save it successfully. So it's your chance to show like a green uh, alert or something like that, telling the user that it was successful. Another similar scenario is editing the markdown, only that out of the six actors that we have in the system right now, the only actor in this scenario that's playing this role is the editor. The entire editing markdown scenario consists of only one event, and that's going from editor to itself, saying that my content has changed, getting the value from the uh, text area or input, and then saving it, updating it in the entire uh, internal state of the editor. And another scenario is checking the user session and user info, which involves the authentication uh, actor, notification actor, and the editor actor. So basically, we don't want to get into that because it's also it has, also has a similar explanation as the previous ones. And one interesting one is also compiling and previewing. Uh, in the compiling scenario, um, the UI will tell the user, the editor, that hey, I want to compile your current Markdown content. Then editor will. Uh, signal the markdown editor, the, sorry, the markdown actor saying that, hey, I, uh, I want you to compile it now. Here's my latest source. Then markdown has a chance to compile it now and run a side effect. And if that uh, hits some errors, it has a chance to send a message or notification saying that here's the error message you need to show, parsing failed. Otherwise, it will get the rendered output and send it back to the preview. Uh, actor saying that, hey, here's the latest HTML that you need to preview. So preview will paint that to the UI for the end user. So you can see that with the uh, actor model, it's just basically a sequence of events that are passed between the actors in the system. And it's really easy to read through that. And this also can act as a, uh, these diagrams can act easily as a documentation of the system behavior. So it, at the end, it would be very, very easy to onboard new engineers to the problem or even talk about these behaviors of the UI based on the user sort is passed from the business level and talk about the technicalities to the business or non-tech uh, stakeholders without having to get into the implementations or technicalities. Another interesting aspect of using actor model for front development is actor models. Actor model plays really well with feature growth. Well, applications don't stay the way they were intended. They're not always stayed as the proof of concept, right? They will grow and sometimes they grow really fast in case of, for example, startups or uh, fast growing projects. What happens here is that if you're using the, uh, let's say that like uh, in our um, we assume that we have an application, right? The markdown render. Let's take that into example again. And now let's say that uh, the project manager has told us that the users want to embed the preview of the markdown in their blocks, but 
for the embedded mode, we don't really need any sort of authentication or we don't need to render the editor at all. Or um, basically we also, um, yeah, I mean, like we don't need the editor and the authentication, right? So those uh, features can be excluded from the embedded mode. But what we do normally is that we just basically, um, it's enough for us to conditionally not render those parts of the application or, uh, you know, like um, hide them from the user. Uh, it would work pretty fine, yeah, but you, I can't sleep well at night knowing that the logic of those uh, behaviors is still in the, in the, you know, in the application uh, system. And uh, knowing that it's possible just the UI doesn't let you interact with that and trigger those scenarios. And um, also means that the complexity of the system still uh, stays the same, regardless of uh, no longer needing, you know, all the actors that have to play the role in the system. So we can, um, with the actor model, we can dynamically put, now change the structure, change the orchestration, put a mode actor in front of the system actor, instead of spawning those other actors directly from the system. Mode has a single job. It detects if you're in the normal uh, mode or you're in the embedded mode. If you're in the normal mode, it uh, registers and spawns those six um, actors that we see before in the uh, system registry. Otherwise, if it's in the embedded mode, it only uh, spawns notification, preview, markdown, and source. It excludes the authentication and the editor because they're no longer needed. And that means that you're taking those actors which are no longer necessary to the application behavior and you're dynamically uh, reacting to what's needed in the application. And that means if a bug happens later on in the embedded mode, you don't have to really go through the uh, user scenarios or sequence diagrams that include the authentication or editor actors because they're no longer in the system at all. They're not just hidden or uh, not conditionally rendered. They're, they're totally excluded from the logic layer. And that's pretty cool, right? Yeah. Um, another benefit of being able to dynamically spawn ad hoc actors in the actor model system and to be able to play around with the complexity of the system is that a system with six actors, as shown on the left picture, is um, can have, since every actor in the system, assuming that they have references to each other, can talk to one other, it means that with n actors in the system, the number of unique messages going from one actor as the origin to another act, uh, actor as a target is going to be n raised by the power of n. And that means in case of six actors in our simple React application, that's going to be six raised by the power of six. And that's in the scale of thousands of unique messages that could be passed technically. But if you reduce it down to three or four for another mode, uh, it can be three raised by the power of three, so 27 unique messages that can be passed in this case. But like for the embedded mode, we saw that they're only needed for four actors. So it's, it's gonna be four raised by the power of four, and that's two raised by the power of eight, 256 unique messages. So compare a scale of thousands of unique messages that could be included in the application layer and the sequence diagrams, compare that to um, the scale of hundreds, which is 256. And that means um, the complexity can be decreased significantly for features that are uh, intended to be lighter than the rest of the application. And it's quite cool. Though it could be a vanity metric, nevertheless, this is still a, a metric to measure the complexity of the system against that. Um, we're getting to the end of the talk here. And I just wanted to tell you that as a recap, we can think anything can be an actor. Uh, well, if it can send an event, if it can receive an event and it can have a private state, then it's an actor, right? I mean, this is the popular idiom about the doc test. But basically, actor has a very thin layer of interface. If it can contain a private bed, a, a private state, and if it can send event to the outside world or receive event from the outside world, it means that it can be an actor. And that means actor model is pretty flexible and quite unopinionated about the implementation of your actors. With the front-end development, we deal with quite a lot of asynchrony. We do stuff over the dimension of time. And for that, we model using callbacks or promises, right? And that means um, if we get to uh, implement promises or um, callbacks as actors and adapt them to the interface of an actor, it means you can pretty much model anything in the front-end side using actors. Uh, you can even like have other primitives, such as 
state machines and state charts as another implementation of an actor or even an observable as an, as an implementation of an actor. So with actor model, you can really mix and match different types of implementations. You can have more complicated actors to be implemented using state charts, but you can have the naive ones or simpler ones to be implemented just using normal promises, callbacks, or even have observables to be reactive, what have you. So just to recap, the advantages of actor model that we went through is actor model is pretty simple in a sense that it's not really opinionated and everything is a message. Since everything happens through message passing, it means no change will happen unless somebody asks for it. Uh, it also helps with the observability of the system. You can understand how the entire application works at the scale by looking at the message sequence or the sequence diagram as we saw. It's like reading through a scenario and tracing what exactly happened step by step. It's like time traveling magic. Uh, there would be no race condition, of course, because actor model inherently tackles the uh, concurrency problems and race condition is one of those issues with concurrency. Actors are a great approach to concurrency without multi-threading, and they fit very well with the event-driven nature of web, and especially platforms such as browsers. Therefore, an entire class of incons inconsistencies due to concurrency is eliminated by just adopting this elegant yet simple architecture. There are scalable, well, we saw that they can build up on top of each other and any actor can be uh, spawned ad hoc. They work really well with web APIs, right? I mean, web APIs are either uh, passing messages like communicating between an iframe and the parent iframe or communicating between the main thread and a worker thread, and they can adapt pretty well. They actually are normally an actor themselves too. Actors are composables. They're really composable. They're really easy to diagnose because they're predictable and everything happens through explicit message passing. And they are isolated logic that are kept outside of the React tree. So you don't have to, you know, deal with the trade-offs of uh, lifting the state up just to make it more accessible to other components or quite constantly have the dilemma of whether uh, to accept the uh, trade-offs of refactoring some local state to React contents and make it available to an entire branch of components or not. So some other additional resources as promised at the beginning of the uh, talk. Well, uh, you can check these resources. I'll be sharing the slides later on with the organizers and they can share it through the mailing list so you can take a look at that. Thank you very much, everybody. And I hope that you took something useful away from the actor models talk. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You heard you're muted. Yes, I was muted. It's like you're muted. That's the most common expression of uh, this time. But yeah, I was <laughs> saying that yeah, we have to make this clapping a habit. And I, I hope everybody is clapping uh, at home as well or wherever they work, uh, wherever they watch. Yeah, people liked it. Uh, this was interesting one. That they, John likes this more than UML. It sort of makes sense. So, uh, I don't know if they were teaching UML where, when you were at the at the university or wherever you went uh, to study, but it's 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 cool. So I have a couple of questions here. Uh, uh, let's let's go go through them. Are there any issues or gotchas with persisting state from a state chart or later loading it to continue the flow? Um, I guess I can take that partially, but I think Matt particularly has some experience with doing that practically. Um, something I wanted to mention as the answer to this question is that XS8 has this built in. Uh, we have a built in way to dehydrate and hydrate, or actually, yeah, dehydrate and hydrate the state, you know, persist it to some sort of um, temporary storage and then bring it back to the scenario and make it live in XS8. And I think there is an state.from API in the core library for doing that. And I've seen some discussions in the community on the Discord that people are actually using it for very, um, very, very like exciting use cases. Matt, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, uh, dehydrating state was what actually I was doing earlier. Um, so <laughs> what, <laughs> Laurie gets it. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, th there's tons of stuff. Um, the, the complicated thing about state charts is that they can spawn other state charts. And so when you're talking about persisting and rehydrating, you're not only talking about a persisting a state chart, but you're also doing it for the entire actor model that it's spawning to. Um, this is a library concern. This is an X state thing. And um, 
This is something that David's actually spending a lot of time on. And David, I think, has a PR in progress right now to be able to do that, to be able to basically take an entire um, serialized um, state chart and actor model with all of its initial states and stuff and just go, boom, there you go, rehydrated. That's really exciting because it solves um, some issues that we're actually seeing with XState in React as well, which is uh, getting fast refresh, working really nicely with, with React. Because the thing about XState is that it's sort of a separate process to React. And in order to get fast refresh working, you need to be able to destroy the entire state tree and re, um, rebuild it, basically. And that's something that is going to be working uh, very soon. But essentially, the the answer to the question, which is, are there any gotchas, is at the moment, yes. But give us like four weeks, and there won't be any gotchas. This is something that we want to do properly and make uh, make a really great experience. I'm pretty sure you're not supposed to promise anything publicly. But hey, uh, <laughs> yeah. one thing to mention about <laughs> one thing I wanted to add to what Matt said is um, rehydrating a state and taking that from there and continuing from there in the scenario doesn't necessarily mean that you're replaying the exact state because some of the side effects are not. You know, you cannot just assume that they have happened before. Mm -hmm. You can't come back from some of the side effects. It's just a one. Yeah, it's, it's this time travel problem. So, so, so you cannot take back some. Like, yeah, it's a conceptual thing. Yeah, it's a yeah. physics problem. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, next one, though. So, do those actor model charts map directly to and send between state machines? It really depends on, um, you know, at what zoom level you're trying to get your sequence diagrams to exactly reflect the implementations. But basically, the more detailed they are, you have a better chance of diagnosing. That's it. I mean, if you know, probably you want to exclude all the messages that went to the self actors because those are like internal events in the actor and uh, looking up from like another level, it wouldn't matter. Most of the integration events that matter are the ones that are sent between the actors because those those are the places that the data transformation happens. All right, I guess next one. So what is the best way to organize communication between actors in React? Uh, Invokes, pod, in global machine, event bus, uh, what will you use? This Matt, is another thing that we're, yeah. One of you two, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is something we've been talking about a lot, actually, recently, which is um, a lot of uh, what XState has been focused on is kind of local component states. It does it really, really well. Um, and you can use it to drive global state in React as well and spawn other actors and things. Um, so the best way um, is, is kind of still up for debate. There's two ways. You can either have a global state machine which spawns other actors. And then in there, you get to use these techniques which are visualizable, where you can actually, from the top machine, spawn another machine and then send an event to it, um, which is quite nice. The other way to do it is you have a machine at the top and then you get React to spawn another machine down the bottom with like a, a use machine or a use interpret, which is kind of like a use state. And to do that, you just kind of, um, the, the, the differences between them is that in the X state one, the parent has a reference to the child. So it can send events to it and it can receive event, events back from it. Whereas in React, um, communication is, is only one direction. It only goes down. So the parent can send, um, oh, sorry, no, in this sense, it's kind of firing off a function which would send an event to its parent. And so you get into this situation where you're kind of doing a bit of React and a bit of X state. And we don't have a strong recommendation for that at the moment. Um, Currently, both ways work. Both ways are pretty ergonomic. Um, so yeah, dealer's choice, really. Yeah, I can also add to what Matt said. Um, with the event bus technique, it means you have a root guardian actor that's going to act as the main proxy of the event. So you either want to have a registry in the parent actor and pass the references to any actor to any other actor so that they can also technically try to talk to each other and pass events between each other. Or you can just basically pass anything through the parent and all the communication goes from there. So if you later on want to you know, like enforce a sort of validation on like a global validation or something, the guardian is there for, for that. And if everything is proxy through that, it's much easier. Um, another thing is uh, it really depends if you want to pass anything, all the messages originating from the UI level to the actors or not, because everything going from the UI to other actors is the ones that React needs to take the responsibility for. And uh, in the in the talk, I was explicitly sending the messages between the actor 
like any particular messages was sent as a side effect of the state machine, but you don't have to necessarily do that. We were recently talking with David about this, that uh, any actor model implementation can afford a very thin layer of subscription. So you can just get notified automatically about the state changes without having to send and receive those messages explicitly at least. Just ask for the change, not ask for get notified. All right. There's one more at least. Uh, is it easy to integrate XState with MobX State 3? I actually saw David receive this question the other day, so I'm going to parrot his answer, which is um, uh, XState and MobX State 3 sort of do some of the same things. Um, but I, I don't actually know that much about MobX State 3. Um, so it could be possible, but from David's answer, it sounded like there was a little bit of overlap. So probably it's easy, but uh, because XState really can integrate with anything, um, but I'm not sure. Yeah, so it's something to uh, try or exercise to the reader, or how did I put it in the last book? Exactly. Cleaning up the class. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I have one one question related to this actor model. So during the past year, I've been working a lot with the web workers and and this uh, observables and reactive stuff. So is there overlap with these technologies and actors, or are they the same? Is it the same thing, or how do you see it? Uh, um, and all that. Okay, getting to the observables. Uh, observables being reactive, they're only one various one of one of many various implementations for an actor. They can send events in the pipeline. They can receive through the pipeline, and they can also have their own internal state. So yes, they can be qualified as an actor. And uh, passing messages in Web APIs such as Web Workers that was also mentioned in the talk. Yes, they're already actors too. And um, yeah, there's post message in the browser, right? Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. So, so I, I was thinking that I've been doing this actor stuff for one year without knowing I've been doing it. So it's sort of yeah, if you if you realize there is no like way of getting around the global scope and accessing things, you know, implicitly, you just have to use the post message for every little thing. Yes, it's annoying at the beginning, but it just ends up being very very predictable at the end. Yeah, that's uh, one more question. How, how far can you uh, take state charts to backend the database? What's the limit? Well, I even take it to the bed if <laughs> that's an answer. Yeah, but, <laughs> <it's> a... <laughs> but uh, well, we are uh, discussing to see the like what are the boundaries. Basically, these are abstract solutions to abstract problems. So they're really agnostic to any sort of technology or a scope. They can be used anywhere. They can even you can even use a search a search chart to model the problems you have in the nature or in day to day life. You know, but. It, they can be used everywhere. I once used it for modeling a CI pipeline in Node.js, for example. And we are working on that. Uh, I know that one of the plans of a stately is to later on tackle the area of workflows. That can yeah. be pretty useful for backend systems. And there's also, yeah. um, you can model anything with it. Like uh, Gatsby use it to model their build process, for instance. So all the node processes and simultaneous things that are going on in a Gatsby build are modeled with XState. Um, but yeah, really, I mean, I've put state charts in you know, lambdas before. Um, you can, one of, the, uh, one of the folks in our in our state discord used it to, I'm going to get this wrong, Rob, so I'm sorry, but he used it as a kind of connector between a, uh, a Steinway piano and like a live app that allowed you to play the piano. I mean, if, if, if there are events involved, which usually even if you're, um, if you don't call them that, there are always events involved, then state charts will be useful. Yeah, one more question. In, in what situations is a state charts overkill or when it's too much? Is there such a case? My biased brain would be never, but um, basically if you don't see the complexity of, I mean, any system will, by experience I'm saying that, any system will eventually get complicated. So you're better off, managing everything with the state charts at first. We even have a you know term informally calling stateless state charts, which are basically just objects that are handling events. So I would um, make my life easier and start using a state chart. And if you're really like, you know, um, worried about the bundle size or everything, uh, XS8 version five is gonna tackle the tree shaking and stuff like that. And uh, you can also use XS8 slash FSM, which is around one kilobyte only, if that's the concern. And if you want, if you more. want to, yeah. sorry, Yuvo. Um, yeah, yeah, if, please go ahead. Yeah. If you want to, uh, if you consider it overkill to include um, it in your app, if your uh, if your bundle size is really sensitive, 
then use state charts to um, power your tests, you know? And you can still verify everything that you're doing through state charts, but not having to include uh, X state in, in your bundle. Or even use it for documentation, yeah. you know, as a PR description. Just tell people what your intent of change is. Yeah. Sort of related are to projects where Redux uh, Flux is more appropri appropriate than state machines. It always boils down to the team preference. So if your team prefers that and under understands that better, because this is just one of the aspects. Engineering is only one dimension. There's a lot more happening in engineering teams and corporations. So consider everything and do the actual engineering yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, given that, um, given that team preferences are completely the same, if everyone knew X state as well as they know Redux, um, Redux is kind of a um, it, it uses events in the same way. Um, it uses a single global store and it uses reduces instead of finance state machines. So it's kind of like X state, but smaller. Um, so if that uh, is a good way for you to encompass your app's logic and you're happy with that, then yeah. All right. So maybe we can do a round of takeaways. So what, what are the points you took with you from this session and, and this kind of stuff? So uh, maybe Laura, you have some. Yeah, I will start with that. I think that state charts are really so beneficial in terms of collaboration. They are going to make it easier to not just write your code, but to share your code and to be able to share what you're working on with the rest of your team of any discipline. And so it's going to make a huge difference to everything you do in that way, because so much of what we do is actually communication rather than writing code. Yep, and having that communication just built in with uh, just as you're building your code, um, I think that's really fascinating. Something that really excites me is being able to build out tooling that makes that uh, easier, more visual, and allow it to be brought earlier and earlier in the process. So when you're using state state charts, should really be the um, one of the first things you build, even pre-design. You know, if you're using your state charts to power your understanding of your app, um, you know, even in the spec stage, then yeah, possibilities are endless. Yeah, if I if I were told like a few years ago, actually at the beginning of my career when I was a junior developer, that there is a there is a way to model the software development with an entity that can help you with testing, development, communication, and can even like you know help you understand your your own code, then I would have learned it from the beginning. So do yourself a favor and teach it to juniors at your uh, companies too. They will really really you know thank you later on in their career. That's such a good point. Yeah. 